Many of us come to Buddhist practice because of the meditation. It's what's distinctive about what the Buddha taught. Which means that we many times miss out on some of the other aspects of what the Buddha taught. Generosity, virtue, the practice of developing merit. Because at first glance it seems as, as if the Buddha has nothing to offer, or nothing distinctive to offer. And so we miss out on some important things. The Buddha often began his discussion of the practice with giving, the topic of giving, the topic of virtue. These provided the foundation for working up eventually to an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And so it's good to look back and see what's distinctive about giving from his point of view, or virtue, why these are an important foundation for practicing meditation. Particularly the the teachings on merit. A lot of us don't like it because it sounds like we're trying to chalk up brownie points. There seems a lot of grasping and calculating in the practice of merit, a lot of selfing. But the selfing is just the point, even though that ultimately the practice is about letting go. The path is not just letting go. The letting go involves some developing as well. And you learn this from the practice of giving. You learn this from the practice of virtue. That when the Buddha teaches letting go, he doesn't tell you to let go of everything all at once, or that all desire is bad, or even that your sense of self is bad. As he explains it, you have to develop skillful qualities, let go of unskillful qualities, and only when the skillful qualities are mature can you let go of those as well. Or as a modern Buddhist psychologist once said, you have to develop a healthy sense of self before you can let go of self. And the practice of generosity, the practice of virtue. These develop just that healthy sense of self, gives you a sense of what things to hold on to, what things to let go of. You can see this in the way the Buddha teaches these things. He doesn't tell you to be generous because you have to be generous, that you have some sort of obligation to other people to give them gifts. After all, who was the Buddha to tell us what we had to do? He didn't create us. He's not our father. But his reasons for speaking in this way are, go deeper than that. He wants to point out to us that we do have freedom of choice, and in generosity we begin to gain a sense of that freedom. We have something, we have more than enough, and we have the choice of whether to keep it or to give it away. And he wants us to focus on that element of choice each and every moment. So on what do we base our choice? What motivates us to give? Realizing that it's going to be for our own welfare, both now and down the line. Notice that he doesn't tell us to give because it's our innate nature to be nice, or our innate nature to be compassionate. He's appealing to another quality called heedfulness, the realization that our actions really do make a difference. And we have to be very careful, because sometimes the things we like to do give rise to suffering. The things we don't like to do can actually lead to happiness. So when he tries to motivate us to be more generous, he points out that we really do benefit 
terms of our own self-respect, our own state of mind, and the way other people regard us. The same with virtue. We benefit now and on into the future in terms of self-respect, in terms of our sense of self-control, and in terms of how other people respect us. In psychological terms, this is called anticipation. It's called a healthy ego function. Now again, we may have heard that Buddhism is against ego, but it's not against ego. It may be against selfishness, it may be against stupidity and all the other things that we tend to associate with a very unskillful ego, but there is skillful ego functioning as well. Anticipation means seeing that your actions do have results and you want to be very careful about what you do. So right there, the Buddha is teaching us some important things about karma, that we have the freedom of choice, but that we also have to be careful because our actions have results, both in the present moment and down the line. So even just the way he teaches the development of merit is teaching some important lessons right there. And in the practice of generosity. He teaches us something that's counterintuitive to us when we're little children, that by giving something away we're going to be happy. But if we do it often enough, we begin to see that it's true. The act of giving things away helps to erase the sense of boundary between you and others, and helps you to see that it is possible to develop a happiness where both sides benefit. Happiness is not a zero-sum game. And that's your ability to help other people to be happy, help other people to enjoy well-being, contributes to your well-being as well. This realization is called altruism. Again, it's another healthy ego function. And as for its virtue, you realize that by saying no to yourself, and you have to learn how to say no skillfully by holding to certain principles, by making promises to yourself that you're not going to be harmful. This develops a strong sense of well-being, too. In psychological terms, this is called suppression. It doesn't mean repression. Repression is when you deny that you have unskillful impulses. Suppression means simply realizing you've got some unskillful impulses, but you learn how to say no to them. You learn how to hold them in check. And so when you exercise your freedom to be generous, when you exercise your freedom to be virtuous, you're developing good qualities in mind that will hold you in good stead as you meditate. Through generosity you bring a more spacious sense of mind to the practice. You have a sense of, a sense of inner wealth. Because that's what generosity is all about. You realize you do have the wealth to share. And you see the good that comes from giving. So that when you come to the meditation, your first question is not what I'm going to get out of this, but the question is what can I give to get the best results out of this? You're more willing to give of your time. That sense of spaciousness and wealth helps carry you over the rough patches in the meditation. As for the practice of virtue, that teaches you you hold on to certain principles, that you don't want to do anything that's unskillful. Now you start bringing that set of principles into the mind. You've learned how to say no to yourself, and hopefully as you practice virtue, you realize it's, it's important how you say no to yourself. So you're not just bottling yourself up and you actually see the advantages that come from making a promise to yourself and holding to it, i.e. holding on in a skillful way. It requires mindfulness, it requires alertness. Mindfulness, in other words, keeping your promise to yourself in mind. And alertness is actually looking at what you're doing. 
And these are good qualities, again, to bring to the meditation, things you want to hold on to as you develop concentration. And you realize that in developing concentration, just the fact that you hold on to your object doesn't mean that you're clinging in an unhealthy way. It's a skillful holding on, because you're developing something. You're developing stronger concentration, stronger mindfulness. Because you're going to need to develop these things in order to let go in a skillful way. As a John Lee once said, the Buddha never taught us to let go like paupers. I just have nothing left. You realize that letting go is done in stages. You develop a healthy sense of self before you want to let go of your total sense of self. And in developing a healthy sense of self, you learn how to let go, though, in the meantime, of unhealthy ways of identifying yourself. When an impulse comes up, you ask yourself, is this skillful or is this not? If it's not skillful, you learn techniques for letting it go, putting it aside. By holding on to the healthy sense of self that says you have to be careful about the results of your actions. By holding on to the sense of wealth that you develop through your generosity, the sense of self-esteem that comes from knowing that you've helped other people and that you've avoided harming them. So the Buddha doesn't have you let go of anything until you no longer need it. And your sense of self, if it's well-trained, can carry you through quite far. You use it in getting the mind into concentration. Realizing that you'll benefit, the people around you will benefit. So you hold on to the object of your concentration. In the meanwhile, you learn that you're developing generosity, virtue, not because it makes you better than other people, but because it makes you happy. Then you want to bring that same attitude to the meditation. As the Buddha said, it's a sign of a person of no integrity that you're proud of your attainments. You've gained this level of jhana, that level of jhana. Other people don't have that level of jhana. I'm better than they are. That's something you want to let go. That's an unhealthy sense of self. You're doing the concentration because it leads to a strong sense of well-being. And the fact that you have it and other people don't, that's irrelevant. Because each of us has to work on our own states of mind. Each of us has to work on our own progress in the training. But we're doing it not to be better than other people. We're doing it because this is how true happiness is found. Happiness doesn't harm yourself, a happiness that doesn't harm other people. This too is a lesson that you learn from generosity, as the Buddha said. A person of integrity gives gifts in a way that doesn't adversely affect himself, doesn't adversely affect anybody else. In other words, you don't give till it hurts. You don't steal from other people so you can give. to this or that person. You look at what you can give. And so lessons from the practice of merit are really important. We read about generosity, we read about virtue, we say, we know all about that. We've heard that many, many times from our parents. Well, the way the Buddha approaches the topic is very instructive. And the lessons we can learn ourselves as we develop these qualities in our own hearts, develop these qualities in our own actions. These are really important. It's a shame that the, these topics get 
short shrift in most discussions of Buddhist practice. Everybody seems to be in a hurry to get on to the higher levels. But the lessons you learn as you develop these preliminary levels really are important. They carry all the way through. So when you talk about practicing, remember it's not just practicing meditation, but it's also practicing generosity, practicing virtue in your daily lives. There was that time at the end of the retreat that Ajahn Sawat taught in IMS, and someone asked him, well, how do we carry over the practice of meditation in daily life? And Ajahn Sawat said, well, you start with the five precepts. And some people got upset. They thought he was talking down to them, that he didn't realize that lay people were capable of more than the five precepts. Well, that wasn't the implication. The implication was that these are an important part of the practice. These are an important part of meditation. Because they teach you these important lessons about what you hold on to so that you can let go skillfully. As I said, the Buddha doesn't teach you to let go of anything until you're ready to let go, until you don't longer until you no longer need it. Your sense of self will take you far. There comes a point though when you don't need it anymore, that's when you let it go. In the meantime, you've learned that there are unskillful ways of identifying yourself, well, you let those go, because they don't serve any real purpose. And as for other ways of identifying yourself, you notice how far they can take you. When they've taken you as far as they can, okay, then you let them go so you can move further. It's when you understand that that your practice is mature. 